Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be with you today here to give this lecture, which is on my PhD thesis, uh, originally entitled uh, Palestinian Civil Society from Mass-Based Movement to Neoliberal-Oriented NGOs, I call it. And uh, here I examine the structural transformation that happened to Palestinian civil society sphere during the 1990s, uh, which has radically shifted uh, a wide segment, a large segment of Palestinian civil society actors from mass-based movement, deeply rooted in the national liberation uh, struggle, to uh, professional developmentist, elitist uh, NGOs, which I call neoliberal NGOs, and I will explain why. So, <coughs> but what, what is the term civil society? Uh, we hear this uh, term almost every day now whether through the media, general discussion in the streets, schools, universities, uh, even governmental statements, <coughs> United Nations, uh, international financial institutions. So civil society is something very important. Uh, <coughs> Firstly, we think we know civil society, but when we discuss it, we will find many differences in understanding the context and the functions of uh, civil society. So civil society actually means different things to different people. <coughs> if you go through the literature on civil society, you, you would be confused in the sense that there is no single agreed, accepted definition on civil society. So for one author, civil society might uh, implicate uh, a wide range of organizations and movements, including the family. For other author, no family is not included, but political parties are included. So here we find a lot of differences and <coughs> And therefore, a civil society can be regarded as uh, a source of never-ending controversies and uh, fueled by intensive academic debates and research, which rather uh, envelop the term with uh, further vagueness and abstraction. But, I mean, after my reading on different literature on civil society, I can con uh, conclude that it's more an ideologically driven term in a sense that it attempts to direct our attention toward the specific formation of social order. It tries to influence political agenda. This is why you find like civil society in Marxist literatures, you find civil society in, lib in different liber liberal perspectives. Uh, there are civil society in, in the new liberal paradigm, there is a libertarian interpretations and, and so on. If we go just give uh, a brief theoretical background on the term, we find that the term was firstly coined by Adam Frickson, who was a member of the Enlightenment period, through his book Essay on the History of Civil Society. He was <coughs> the first to introduce the term, although his interpretation was a bit simplistic in a sense that he didn't uh, differentiate between the state and civil society. There was no state-civil society dichotomy, according to his interpretation. He rather explained that uh, civil society emerged because of the development of uh, of uh, modern state, rule of law, and uh, socio-economic improvement and socio-economic structure of the society. So his interpretation was very general until we uh, <coughs> saw Hegel uh, specifying civil society and he made clear the distinct between state civil society and for him uh, civil society was more located between the state and the family. and. Uh, Generally, his also uh, contribution was a bit free. Karl Marx was also inspired by Hegel in this sense, but he's, he provided a very materialist and deterministic interpretation of civil society. He located civil society in the economic base that is in opposition to the suprastructure economic base where uh, the relation of production are formed and the suprastructure where the state, culture, ideologies are reflecting actually the economic base. So he saw this domain or this sphere is more controlled, shaped by the bourgeois. Therefore, he excluded the working class from being involved in, in guiding the dynamic of civil society. Then another influential <coughs> theorist was uh, Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci, although he was Marxist, but his interpretation and analysis was completely different. He instead uh, located civil society in the superstructure along with the state and ideologies and the culture. And, uh, and uh, according to Gramsci, uh, civil society is uh, the arena where cultural hegemony is established. 
this term is very important and it's still very influential until this time, until the present, because uh, uh, briefly, cultural hegemony is based on the assumption that the state has two tools of control. First of all, there's the cultural hegemony. Cultural hegemony is used through civil society, through its diverse organizations, media, educational systems, schools, families, the church, which all contribute to the sustaining of cultural hegemony of the dominant class. So the dominant class actually controls the society to, through this cultural hegemony. Now, when this cultural hegemony is challenged, we find the state resort into its coercive apparatus. Coercive apparatus means uh, the army, the police, and the mukhabarat, for example. Uh, look at, the, for example, the latest Egyptian experience, the Egyptian revolution after 32 years of Hosni Mubarak's rule, using civil society, its media, schools, universities, and uh, so on, to promote the cultural hegemony of his ruling class to sustain his power. And what happened when people started to challenge this cultural hegemony, quickly he resorted into the army and police to stop this, uh, this uh, revolutionary dynamic. So this is si a simple uh, example of Gramsci's, uh, Gramsci's meaning of, of cultural hegemony. As I said, uh, Gramsci was very influential. He, now there are all the theories, new Gramscian theories that uh, uh, try to develop the Gram Gramscian perspective on civil society. However, the most influential <coughs> inspiration was that of uh, critical theory that emerged later by Frankfurt School. And the most important figure here that we need in this understanding is Habermas. Habermas who introduced the term public sphere, where it's like a space where people meet and discuss uh, issues of, uh, of public concern, uh, political issues, economic issues, social issues, and so on. And uh, this, <coughs> this site where people discuss all things can be coffee shop, can be, for example, this class where we are sitting. It's part of the public sphere. We are discussing. We are exchanging ideas and so on. But it's necessary also to put clear distinction between the public sphere on one hand and the market. The market is the site where people exchange money, goods, commodities. And we need also to make it different from the state and its official apparatus and where uh, the official procedures take place. So we are in the middle here. <clears throat> so what I want to shed the light on quickly the, about civil society, historically, this term appeared, disappeared according to the necessities of the case as a term. But in actuality, it existed all the time. Take, for example, in the post-Second World War until the end of the Cold War, there was there were no debates or intensive debates about the civil society as an important term in the societies and social transformation, but it ex existed and sometimes powerfully existed. For example, take the uh, civil liberties movement in the United States. Take, for example, even the Palestinian case here during the 70s and 80s, we had strong civil society, but nobody was talking about because it was absent from the academic circles and, and uh, from the political place. How you translate in, uh, in Arabic and if it, the translation Arabic and connotate a different thing that's the use of civil society that you are Well, here we are going to the, the, the typical civil society. We need to know that civil society, our mujtama al-madani, is imported concept. It's not originated from the local context or our historical experience. But we have our own <coughs> term here. It is mujtama al-ahli. In Palestine or the Arab world, we call it al mujtama al-ahli. Lijan al is part of the civil society, and it's an organization or a network, but the term here is Mustama Ahli. This yani, is now became traditional, it's not used anymore because of the invasion of the term civil society. You know, Civil society eventually has emerged from the European historical experience. Uh, and then after uh, the end of the Cold War and the globalization process, the term has been generalized on the global system and it's used everywhere to, to describe different phenomena. Uh, di uh, different organizations, but what we are witnessing right now is there is an intentional attempt to promote a strict version of civil society. That is of Eurocentric civil society, NGOs, and so on. I will go to this point later, but until the end of the Cold War, I, as I told you, the, the term was absent. But what happened after the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the emergence of a new world order, the process of globalization, which also meaning, me, meant that the globalization of, of transnational processes of democratization, development, and so on, that all were planned, designed in, 
in whether uh, Western governments, uh, Western institutions, uh, organizations, international financial institutions, World Bank, IMF, and so on. So one of the major characteristics of this new version is the proliferation of the so-called non-governmental organization, NGOs, which are to a large extent um, described as professional. Uh, they are following you know, certain development procedures or techniques uh, according to the st international standard of international development industry. Uh, this also process is accompanied by, by <coughs> you know, the democratization process. Uh, if we go back to Huntington's uh, third wave democratization to describe you know, the democratization that happened in, in Latin America and East Asia, Asia at that time, he focused on civil society and its role in this transformation. On the other hand, what also gave a chance for these NGOs to emerge is that the transformation of the development process from uh, state-led development to, to market-led development. The state-led development, as you know, in the post-Second World War, the state had uh, very essential roles in, 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 in the planning and the guiding the development process. But after that, uh, especially after the crisis of 1970s, uh, they introduced neoliberalism or neo, neo, neoliberal policies as, as uh, the major guidance of the development process. They, therefore, they started with the privatization, market deregulation, deep cuts in public services, and gave many functions of these development processes to NGOs instead of the state. So when a state was withdrawn from, the, from <coughs> controlling or guiding the, the, the development process, it left a gap. This gap has been filled gradually and partially by uh, the so-called NGOs. Also, another aspect that gave them wrong is new policy agenda. New policy agenda actually uh, means a combination of economic liberalization, that is neoliberalism, and liberal democracy as uh, introduced you know, by the Western understanding of representative democracy. New policy agenda is attached to Washington consensus. I don't know if you heard about this term. Washington consensus, consensus post-Washington consensus, was post-Washington consensus, and it means the same thing that the promotion of neoliberal policy at the global scale. Another term that can be helpful in this is sociological. It's called localization. Localization is a combination of global and local. Simply means think globally, act locally. For example, you see like a local NGO in Palestine. It's called local in the sense that it was established in Palestine. It gets its fund from abroad, from governments, from donors' agencies. But what is required here is to act locally, to work at the local level, but at the same time to think globally according to the international standards of development, industry, and so on. Another aspect is the interaction with international financial institutions. And here I mean uh, World Bank, uh, International Monetary Fund. And if you go to their website, they have special sections on civil society. They try to promote certain uh, specific uh, and narrow understanding of civil society. They provide many definitions, and they even include grassroots organizations and mass-based movement in this, uh, in this uh, definition, and uh, trying to uh, <coughs> bring, them, bring them to the orient of neoliberalism, giving them fund, and uh, asking them to uh, conduct some uh, capacity building. Therefore, capacity building means gradual transformation of the organization itself from a certain one that is grassroots to professional one. <coughs> also, NGOs, the way they operate is uh, market-based because you know, they work more on fundraising. They try to adopt the market logic in guiding their activities and trying to get money and to perform their operations. So now we can go to the Palestinian civil society. Palestinian civil society in its own is very particular and exceptional. Uh, it's difficult in a sense that it has theoretical dilemma. We have spoken before about the uh, civil society state dichotomy. This is very important and essential in any definition of civil society took into consideration that civil society is always this via the state. However, in Palestinian case, it's completely different due to the historical absence of the state. We have no state, and therefore this has provoked controversial theoretical debates uh, in the last uh, Decade, particularly in the early 1990s when this uh, term entered Palestine. You know, Palest uh, Palestinian history is characterized by foreign powers, colonial domination, uh, and never a state or a uh, state in its own. 
And uh, another aspect of the, this theoretical dilemma is that the fragmented nation, we are, fragmented nation can, we are not talking about a nation that is uh, unified under uh, uh, sovereign government, rather we are fragmented here and there in Lebanon, Syria, abroad, West Bank, Gaza, and here also questions the validity of, of, of the role of nation in constructing a civil society. In addition, we have the geographical discontinuity, uh, continuat <coughs> continuity, and here you can apply it also on, on West Bank, Gaza, Palestinian abroad, Palestine here and there, and even Hebron, Bethlehem, Ramallah, it's not easy to go and you know, uh, keep or uh, maintain this uh, continuity and uh, connection. So in the early 1990s, Palestine witnessed intensive debate, uh, hot debates among scholars and researchers on the term civil society, whether it exists in Palestine or not, and if it exists, does it have particular characteristics or not? Well, uh, some authors, some scholars concluded that, yes, in Palestine we have civil society. Some of them said, okay, we can, if we have no state, at least we can lo locate civil society with, uh, with these uh, foreign powers and colonial dominations, although they represent illegal, uh, illegal authority or illegitimate authority, but eventually they are authority. They are kind of state that is imposed on us. Others went further to say, no, we don't have civil society in Palestine. What we have actually is political society due to the fact that most of the organizations that emerged during the 70s and 80s were, were affiliated to one or more political parties, were invention of Palestinian factions and political parties and were guided by the principles of Palestinian liberation organization. Others will, we can make combination here. Wait a moment, they played civil role, but at the same time they played political role as such. We can call what we have in Palestine political civil, political civil society. And the last uh, one said, no, we don't have any civil society. The pioneering, uh, pioneering <coughs> Uh, scholars uh, on this was Azmi Bshara. Azmi Bshara rejected the concept of civil society and its applicability in Palestine due to the aforementioned reasons. Mm -hmm. And he said particularly because of the absence of citizenship in Palestine. It's not necessarily also that we have a state and society. We need also to have kind of democratic life or democratic state where citizens can exercise uh, exercise <clears throat> their freedom to build associations and so on. But if we look briefly on the history of civil Palestinian civil society, here we can see that it's actually quite old. It emerged initially in the latest in the latest phase of the Ottoman Empire when it started to make radical reform of its institutions, got uh, got govern its mode of governance and uh, and uh, administration and this law of 1909, which gives the right of association, was in, largely inspired by the fr French law of 1902. Then the, the kind of organizations that emerged at that time were like very simple kind of charitable organizations, sometimes uh, uh, women uh, associations as well. Until we reached the British mandate here, British colonialism, which lasted for uh, over 20 years, and here we witnessed kind of different development in the Palestinian associational life or civil society. We witnessed uh, new charitable organizations that were largely controlled by, by traditional elite, notable families, landowners, and so on. We also witnessed a kind of modern structure such as labor unions, and where they were highly uh, influenced by, by the communist, Palestinian Communist Party that was established in 1922. We can find also social movement in Palestine. Uh, during this uh, period, in addition to other uh, small associations here and there. But after, after 1948, uh, the Nakba, this form of associa uh, associational life or this emerging civil society has entirely collapsed. Mm. People went to Lebanon, <coughs> Syria, expelled there, and the West Bank and Gaza, West Bank became, you know, part of were incorporated into the Jordanian Kingdom, but Gaza was under the uh, Egyptian administration. And if we, if we focus here on the West Bank and Gaza, we will find different de political development, different socio-economic uh, interaction and structures due to the fact that they were incorporated into completely different states. United Kingdom of Jordan, of Jordan 
imposed, for example, its citizenship on the Palestinian and it rejected any kind of expression of Palestinian identity. They said, no, Palestinians here are not Palestinian, are Jordanian. And it allowed them to, to join, for example, some Jordanian associations, uh, to establish uh, some charitable associations, but they should be linked to the legal order of Jordan. Uh, in Egypt or in Gaza, the case was a bit different because uh, Egyptian allowed Palestinian to form associations, but these associations shouldn't uh, should be uh, part of the ideology pan-Arabism or Arab nationalism at that time. It didn't allow, for example, communists to establish their own organizations. It didn't allow Islamists to establish their own associations, but should be all all uh, based on the ideology of pan-Arabism. On one hand, on the second hand, Egypt wasn't yeah, new give the Palestinians space to express their own identity as Palestinians, but as part of the wider Arab world. So Here we go to an important phase for the development of Palestinian civil society in 1970s and 80s. And what helped this civil society to emerge, firstly, was here the PLO, the emergence of PLO, the emergence of modern structure.